And today we have two classes which is basically analyze this. These classes are essentially for yourselves. They're, it's not that I come with a, a script for you, but rather uh, this is an opportunity for you to submit your games, uh, games that you may be proud of or may be wondering what did I do wrong, and then we would have a back and fro. But unfortunately, all I have is one score sheet in front of me, so I mean it's a force majeure. Okay, the following game is between Joe Gardner and Nick Karloff. Okay, we open up with E4. This is actually a pretty good move. <laughs> D6. I like this move too. Okay, so D4, E5, Knight F3. Give me the pawn. Knight D7. That, uh, Knight D7 is actually considered... Uh, a second-rate move. Knight d7 right away should have issues, and I think it does. Bishop c4, an excellent move, an excellent move. So the point of the move bishop c4 is to put instant pressure against the pawn on f7. Now black has a problem that if he now tries to play knight f6, then knight g5 really is a problem for black, and black has issues. Um, black in the game played bishop e7, and white missed an opportunity. Uh, as is well known in this position, white has a winning move, a winning move. Julian. D takes e5, D takes e5, queen d5. That's, that's nice. And that pawn on f7, ooh, there's no defense with knight h6 because simply bishop takes h6 and the pawn on f7 is hanging. Again, we see why the inclusion of knight f6 and knight c3 earlier was so very important. After bishop e7, we now know for sure that white could have won with the move d takes e5, as we've seen. But instead, white thought everything's copacetic. He castles, and black errors once again. Black errors with the move c6. It becomes more and more vital for him to play knight uh, f6, but at least c6, one good point of the move c6 is that variation that Julian pointed out with queen d5, at least that is no longer available. White has played c3, which isn't a bad move. White fortifies his center and he has a threat. His threat is to play queen b3, developing a battery with queen and bishop, against the pawn on f7. Black has played knight f6, countering attacking the pawn on e4, and preparing to get his king out of dodge with castles. Rook e1, very good, castles. So at this point, uh, none of black's moves uh, have been punished. And in a sense, white's advantage can, can, can boil down to the fact that he has a little bit more space, a little bit more activity in the center. But I believe this position is fully balanced. I don't think that white has an edge at all. Castles, h3. Oops, this is a bad move. h3, bad move. A uh, much more uh, standard move in this position would be the move bishop b3. h3 allows black an opportunity for either knight takes e4, which I think is a very good move, or d5, which I think is a very good move. In both cases, black literally breaks out. Bad move by black, b5. Well, a bad move... Uh, this is like second best. It's not bad, 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 or anything like that, but it's just that d5 or knight e4 are both such superior 
uh, moves for black. B5 helps white do what he wants to do. White step back with his bishop. Bishop B3. Bishop B7. Now, after knight BD2, slight uh, plus for white because his center is nicely protected, defended. White has the harmonious and well-known maneuver knight f1 to g3 coming up. Knight bd2, h7, h6. Uh, uh, taking control of g5 to keep the, the uh, f7 pawn protected, knight f1. Well, both sides are playing quite well here, I must say. Rook e8, knight g3, bishop f8. Good play. Bishop c2, okay. So that looks kind of tragic. Joe has played bishop c2, over protecting the pawn on e4. Black has said, okay, I'll develop queen c8. And it appears as Joe's had a conversation with his bishop and his rook. And his bishop says, well, the c1 diagonal is not very promising. Let's play b2, b3. And so, okay, this move then becomes justified with the idea that you got out of the way. Um, it might have been, again, nicer to include this move a4. Why? If we imagine for a moment's sake that we provoke the move a6. Now, what white can and perhaps should consider is the move b4. Okay. Now, can somebody try to explain to me why b4 might be a better square for the pawn than the b3 square? Give it a shot. You can only be wrong. Jillian. Yeah, that's right. So if we say here, in this position, is the bishop on c2 ideal? No, we can't say it's ideal. We, we, we can say it has a task, manning the post, defending the pawn on e4, but it's not like it's reaching into black's position. If we put the pawn on b4, however, first of all, we're still making room for our bishop, and we're giving ourselves the possibility of playing bishop b3 in the near future. So, again I like a4, b3 was played. Oh, last point, very important point, I, <laughs> very important point I should point out, is that after the move c5, the move b4 really does discourage the move c5, because after a trade of pawns, we do get a very nice protected pass pawn on the d5 square. Now, a lot of grandmasters will look at that pass pawn on d5 and not be afraid of it. They'll say, go ahead and have it. I'll have a good blockade with my bishop, and I'll play a move like c4, and then this knight will come to c5. I just, I'm just one of those players, I, I like having a pawn protected pass pawn on d5, and I do like uh, neutralizing the bishop on b7. Jillian? Um, is it better to the pawn with the bishop, or, uh, or to play like knight e6 with the bishop? Okay, uh, so the question really, your opponent has a protected pass pawn. What is the best blockader? The best blockader is a knight. Full stop, end of story. You'd love to have a knight on d6 uh, blockading the pawn. The second blo best blockader is a bishop, yeah? So the bishop isn't bad, it's not bad. The knight's better, but hey, uh, the bishop's not bad. Why is the knight better than the bishop in such positions? Why is the knight better than the bishop? The bishop does a great job blockading the, the the pass pawn, all right, that, that really does. But uh, in terms of the space count, 
does the bishop help the space count? Not at all. The, the bishop is just defending the pawns on e5 and c, c5, so the bishop is blocked. It doesn't attack any of white's territory. Conversely, we stick a knight on d6. We understand that the knight's doing a great job defending, blockading the d5 pawn, but also as a blockader, it's attacking the squares e4 and c4. So it's reaching into white's camp. So it's doing that dual function like these knights of being aggressive and defensive. This knight's being defensive, but it's also being aggressive. So the knight's the best blockader. The second best piece is the bishop, and the worst piece is the queen. The queen is a terrible blockader. First of all, because she's not a great blockader, I mean, she does nothing. She just stands there in front of the pawn. Instead, she's got all of these great powers, and she's belittling herself by simply being a blockader. The worst part about a blockade with the queen is that any attack, any time the queen's attacked, the queen's got to run. So she's <laughs> not much of a blockader at all, you know. Knight pops to f5, queen's got to run. Rook comes to c6, queen's running, you know. Bishop comes to a3, and so on and so on. All right, so we take these moves back, and we put the pawn here, we put the pawn here. We don't include the move a4, a6, we just shoot right away with b3. Okay, all of these criticisms, judgments, are not meant in any measure uh, to say blunder mistakes, mistakes, or anything like that, but uh, rather to uh, express the idea that you can't be uh, absolutely sure that your move is good. Like, that there's something, you know, like you're making a move. Well, first of all, you're spending a tempo. And you oftentimes got to ask yourself, is that the wisest uh, use of a tempo? Secondly, when you play the move b3, you open up a diagonal for one bishop, but close it for the other. And again, that gets us back to that b4 move for a second. So b3 was played, rook a d8. Black is doing fine, by the way. Black is doing a very good job, bishop b2. And we can actually even say, that black has developed his uh, army quicker than white. White still remains with a rook on a1 as well as a queen on d1. After this move, rook on a d8, white might say, might, white might have said to himself, "Darn! I really regret the fact I didn't play a4, trade a, trade a pair of rooks because at the moment." It's black's rooks that are centralized. And after bishop b2, black broke in the center with d5. Now, I'm not sure if this move is the best move, but it certainly fits the needs of the position. <laughs> the needs of the position require that black, who's fully developed, now takes an active approach and attacks in the center. d5, e takes d5. Okay, c takes d5. Also, something to be recommended for knight takes d5 as well. But black was very ag aggressive. He's thinking that with this pawn on d5, he's beginning to open up his light square bishop. Thankfully, from black's point of view, the move d5 opened up his dark squared bishop right away. d takes e5. Knight takes e5, knight d4. OK. Uh, black, uh, pardon me, white centralizes his knight. Black has a centralized knight. So from white's point of view, from white's point of view, white plays this move. What are some of the st strategic motives behind this move, knight d4? Can somebody tell me from a strategic point of view? what this knight on d4 is all about. Bingo. Absolutely. So with the knight centralized on d4, what you're doing is blockading the isolated pawn 
when you blockade the isolated pawn, you're kind of putting this bishop. Uh, there's no sacrifices with d5, d4, so this bishop is being neutralized. Okay. Uh, secondly, the knight on d4 is also reaching out over here, and it's reminding black that, by the way, your pawn on b4 is hanging. So the idea, what we would say, is that with this move, knight to d4, we're blockading the pawn, we're centralizing our knight, and we're attacking this pawn on b4. Now then, from black's point of view, uh, black also has a very nice centralized knight. And if I was black, I'd be thinking in terms of continuing the centralization. Like, I would want, even though we talk about the isolated pawn at times being weak, I'd also, uh, I'd want to be able to jump into the center and to extend this diagonal, if I can make that work tactically. For the moment, I have to uh, pay attention to my pawn on b5. White, black, pardon me, has played bishop c5. Okay, I'm not 100% sure I get that move. Obviously, it's nice to bring this bishop, which is okay, it's quietly defending black's king, but with the bishop on c5, it aims at white's king and maybe this pawn on f2. I'm not 100% sure how this move defends this pawn on b5. So if I was in black shoes with this pawn on b5, I would be considering queen b6, just defending the pawn. I would be considering the move b5, b4, yeah, attacking the pawn. And if you take, I take with the bishop and attack the rook. But after the move bishop c5, I think that this pawn on b5 is hanging. Rook c1, OK. Uh, Joe, why didn't you take? Um, there was a mutual time pressure going on. OK. Was, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Uh huh. That's my rationale. Okay. Like, I'm just playing safe enough, but, yeah. yeah, well, rook c1 is definitely, I put that in the category of a safe move. I'm one of those, I'm an old pawn grubber. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> I, give, me that, give me your pawns, baby. You know, like Julian, yeah. I'm not sure. I didn't quite see it. Yeah, me too. Uh, if for any, any moment the queen b6 check to the king and to the knight, the knight would jump back. So what you're looking at is maybe to go on a rampage like this. The only problem is I think you're giving up two, you, you've given up two pieces already, and I'm not 100% sure uh, you, you got enough, right? Do you have enough? Uh, sorry, check. I can. It's two pieces. That's a lot. Two pieces. Two pieces. Two pieces. Two pieces. This, I think, is 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 not enough. I mean, it's definitely something. That, like you said, Joe, in time trouble, you might see a move like bishop f2 and knight g4 and say, uh, <coughs> I'm not going to give my opponent that chance. But on the other hand, when you get a concrete, moment, concrete opportunity to win a pawn that looks like a gift, boy, I mean, I feel like a bank robber. <laughs> like, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it if I, can, if, I, if I feel I can get away with it. I'll take it. Um, Knight takes d4 wasn't played, rook c1 developing a piece. Although I'm not quite sure I feel that that's such an effective use. Maybe I would prefer maybe a move like queen d2 or rook e3 followed by rook e1 trying something like that. Uh, rook c1 for the moment looks like a kind of a pass move. 
Not bad, not good. It is, okay. A6, okay. A6. Now, this move I like. Knight g f5, bringing your knight into the game. Knights on f5, especially against the h6, g7, f7 pawn structures are very good. It's very hard for black to get rid of that knight. He can't really play g6 uh, because the h6 pawn is on pre. However, the drawback is that you're giving up control of the e4 square and indeed Black jumped with his knight, knight e4. Oh boy. So, uh, as things have progressed, I would say that black has a considerable advantage. Black has a considerable advantage. Why would I say that? Well, it's a very interesting thing about knights. Knights are short range pieces. You got to get them into your opponent's camp. You've got to get you, to, to bring them forward. Knights love centralized squares. So while the knights are a little bit offsetting each other at the moment, there's something else that knights love. Knights crave protection. Okay? The more a knight is defended, the stronger it is. Now if we think about it in our mind, if we imagine a knight in the center of the board, in the outpost in the center that can't get pushed away, and it's supported by all kinds of pawns, the opponent never really wants to capture the knight because then the pawns recapture and the knight gets to sit down in the, in the middle of the board. Black's knights are better defended than white's knights. This knight has one defender, the other knight. Boris Spassky described these two knights as standing on each other's hooves, <laughs> yeah? That uh, their potential is reduced because they're in the state of mutual protection. This knight is only defended once, whereas if you look at black's knights, they're defended multiple times. This knight on e4 by the pawn, by the bishop, by the rook. This knight on e5 by the rook, by the queen. So these knights are actually better than white's knights. Next, if we look at the bishops, we can compare their activity to one another. We might not be overjoyed by this bishop on b7. It is there. We're a little bit more, uh, that's a bit of a better bishop on c5. But these two bishops are rather passive. Yeah? Secondly, we, compare, we make a comparative observation about the queens. This queen on d1 has not developed. This queen on c7 has. We make a comparative observation about the rooks. The rooks on e1 and rook on e8 cancel each other out. They're equal. This rook on c1 has less potential than the rook on d8. Yeah? So from a comparative point of view, knights are better, black's bishops are better, his queen is better, and his rooks are slightly better. So white is, um, stands worse. It's really that simple. Uh, white makes a big move, and I'm going to say a bad move. A uh, big move, f2, f4. Uh, in, the, in, in the immortal words of Victor Korchnoi, pawns don't move backwards. <laughs> you know? And when you play the move, like this knight on e4 is a good knight. But it's not a Thor, a god of thunder. It's, it, it, it could be potentially, it, its outpost is not eternal. There's F2, F3 that could push the knight. I'm not saying that F2, F3 is a good move, but I'm saying that F2, F3 exists as an option in the position for, for white. When white plays the move F2, F4, he has to, he does so under the realization that with this move, that knight on e4 ain't moving. It's there forever, right? So it's sort of like uh, you as white, Joe, when you play this move f4, you might get yourself all hot and excited that you're attacking a knight on e5 and forcing it to move. But from black's point of view, black sits there and says, ooh, I'm really happy about that move. Boy, well, my knight on e4, it's, it's going to hang on there for a long time. f4, knight g6, 
And by the way, retreating the knight has opened up a pretty juicy target. This pawn on f4 is vulnerable to the knight and to the queen. g3 defending. And I must say that uh, black has played very well. Uh, I like what black has done. So from my point of view, if I was in black shoes, I would be um, smacking my lips a little bit here. I would start thinking, can I play the move knight takes f4, g takes f4, queen takes f4. My queen would be threatening to capture the knight thanks to the pin. My queen might be threatening to come to f2 check. So knight takes f4 starts to be attractive a little bit uh, or a lot of it. Uh, but I might think that after knight f4, g f4, queen takes f4, oops, I got to be a little bit careful. There is a move queen g5, queen d1 to g4 with a threat of queen g7 mate. Queen f2 check, king h1, and I don't have knight g3 mate because there's a knight on f5. So while I may find knight f4 very attractive, I would try to go through the calculations. I like what bl black did. Black took another approach in this position. He said, the bishop on b7 is not fully functioning. He's having this conversation with his pieces, right? Saying, hey, buddy, can you uh, earn your keep? Can you do a little bit more? And the bishop says, yeah, I can. I'll play bishop back to c8. I'll threaten to take the knight. If the knight moves, looky, looky. I got a pawn, and you should know I live for pawns. You know, uh, bishop takes h. So I like this move, bishop c8. Bishop takes e4, d takes e4. I like this move, d takes e4. If we consider, I'm not saying it's absolute, but if we consider the idea that black is on the attack, that black's got the initiative, he's got his mojo going. Whenever you're on the attack, avoid unnecessary piece trades. When, you're, when you trade pieces, you're losing firewood to make a bonfire. So you capture on e4 with a pawn and don't trade rooks because you're losing um, firewood. So I like what white, black has played marvelously here. Bishop takes, d takes e4. This knight is hanging. Behind it stands the pawn on h3. These two knights are uh, mutually defending, but this bishop on c5 is terrifying. This pawn can be undermined with a break like b4. So a lot of good things are happening in this position for black. And white's in deep trouble. Queen h5. Probably forced, Joe. Yeah, according to the computer, too. Oh, hey, good man. OK. Queen. Back to the position after that was recommended. Yeah, get rid of that knight on e4. OK, so the queen on h5, first of all, we might say that this, is, this uh, move is aggressive, that uh, black, white activates his queen at last, or brings it into the game. But the r true reality of this move is actually it was required in the sense that the knight couldn't move. The queen actually ends up protecting the knight as well as uh, protecting the pawn on h3. So queen h5, queen b6 was played. OK, so let me just stop here for a second. So, hmm. Well, one of the moves I'm very attracted to is I would love to play this move, rook to d5. Why? From my point of view of black, I'm putting this knight on f5 into a pin uh, to the queen, and I'm preparing to play the move bishop takes d4 and to take this knight. There's a small problem. The knight could move away with a discovered check, and oh dear, the, queen, the rook isn't protected. So even though I would find this move, rook take 
rook to d5 as strategically very attractive, tactically it doesn't work. So maybe I would make a move to prepare rook d5. I might play king h7. Julian? Um, I considered it a move ago before this knight was captured, but uh, did you have a specific follow-up after queen takes f4, or you have a, um, you're threatening to play queen takes f5 as well as bishop, and again, thanks to this pin, right. So I'm assuming rook f1. Okay, but you sacrificed a, a piece for two pawns. Uh, let's just go back to c7 for a second. And I'm thinking that maybe white is prepared to play on the knight takes g7, rook g1, e3. Just a second, I'll check my rule book. Yes, it's legal. Yes, good man. But I don't know. I think uh, white might, might get you first. Uh, is, uh, don't you find this a little frightening? Um, knight h6, g h6, queen h6. Uh, right. So I'm not ex exactly 100% sure. But OK, let's say I just take with the idea of rook g1. If bishop b7 check, let's say, I'll have to drop my, bring my rook up to f3. So I'm thinking that if it's my turn, I'll get to play rook g1. I'm not sure. You could take my rook, take and maybe you should play a move like. I was thinking maybe playing queen g3 after rook g1 will take it and play Okay, so to sacrifice your queen, yeah? So something like this perhaps, yes? And uh, from White's point of view, it's like he's got to ask his partner. He says, give me a rook. Give me a knight. You know, like, I got to get some checkmate uh, action going. So from White's point of view, his queen needs help. OK, so c4 to give me something. OK, bishop d4 looks kind of forced. And uh, let's see. Um, so let's give you a check. And you got, I think you got to go to the H line. If you go to F8, I've got a nasty check on the diagonal waiting. I don't think you can go to H8. Maybe I could take and, yeah. So I'm thinking H7 for, for the moment, yeah? And let me take the bishop, threatening mate. Trade. And let me take this pawn, yeah? Something like this. And right, there's a, there's a check that defends the knight in case. So um, yeah, I mean, again, those sacrifices with uh, knight takes f4, I think that those types of calculations would, would be going through my mind. Like, I would be thinking, can I get away with, with this uh, sacrifice? OK, what do I got? Knight is here. Pawn is perhaps here. Knight is perhaps here. Pawn is here and here. Or was the knight? I'm sorry. I'm missing some, some wood. Yeah, missing some wood. And another knight on f5, correct? <laughs> How did it get down to g1? Okay, 
So we get this position, and uh, we were just looking at some possible uh, fun variation with knight f4, and I was thinking that the move rook d5 was a killer, just a stone cold killer, except it loses <laughs> <laughs> to knight h6. So in my mind's eye, what I might find myself very attracted to is a pre, not a preemptory, uh, a preparatory move. Ah, I knew it existed, there was a word. A preparatory move like the move king h7, and I'm, you know, hands are waving. I'm saying, looky, looky, I've got this idea of, of utilizing my centralized rooks to play rook d5 and to cause uh, white, uh, again in the words of Victor Korchnoi, unpleasant sensations. <laughs> <laughs> rook d5 will evoke unpleasant sensations. Uh, black has, a, has played a pretty reasonable move. I, 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 it might even be a better move than king h7. Black has played the move queen b6. Yeah, queen b6. So from black's point of view, he's putting additional pressure on this diagonal. Maybe he decides that the queen might even be m a little bit more frisky over here on the f6 square. Maybe he's thinking that uh, if he takes this knight, he wants to be out of the way of the rook. And finally, he could also be thinking that, hey, with the move b4 to undermine the knight on d4. So the move queen b6 certainly does uh, look attractive. Um, along with Julian's knight f4, when we calculate, the way we calculate, you know, you see these grandmasters, man, I saw this, 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 this. We go, wow, how did he calculate that line? Um, when we calculate uh, grandmasters, the first thing in our checklist of calculations is check. Ah, any checks? Ah, so we look at checks first. If checks don't exist, we just look at direct captures. So if I were black and I'm trying to get an advantage, the first move I would calculate is does the move bishop takes d5, do I get an advantage with this move? Does that bring me advantage? I can calculate. I take the knight. He's got to take my bishop. Cool. The next thing is I go, OK, I can calculate this. So, and by the way, how sweet it is. It comes with check. Uh, check, right? So I've just given up two bishops for two knights. He's got to recapture. Now, I st again, I continue the line. I don't give up. Because what attracts me to this uh, sequence of moves is white's king. I'm attracted to this sequence of moves because I think that this pawn shield has been a little, pushed a little bit further ahead and make black, white's king a little bit vulnerable. So I continue the sequence in my mind. I play queen a5. Oops, my queen is under attack. I'm going to play queen a5. Why do I continue the sequence of moves? Well, I start to think, huh, isn't this interesting? First of all, I'm threatening to capture a pawn, which would attack the bishop, which would attack another pawn. And if I can go eat, 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 <laughs> you know, I live for one pawn. Give me three. I'm ecstatic, joyous, you know, like carry me out, you know. Okay. So, queen, a so I think to myself mentally, okay, the queen comes out here. I'm going to go here, here, eat, 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 eat. Oh, look at this. I can also bring my queen to this attractive square, d2, and maybe in connection with this pawn, I can also push my pawn up the board. So I would, I would concretely calculate bishop takes f5, bishop takes d4, queen a5. Like if Joe, uh, if Joe wants, we can continue the calculation, and we could go rook takes e4. Then in my mind, 
the first move I'm going to calculate is queen takes a2. I'm going to say, ha ha, I'm going to get that pawn back, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I, lose, I lose a pawn, I've got to have a good reason. I'm going to get it back. The second thing I might look at is, hey, how about queen d2? Uh, how are you going to defend your bishop, right? Um, so the, uh, as a, uh, if in my calculation, my judgment brought me to a position where I was dissatisfied with bishop takes f5 and bishop takes d4, I would start to think about knight takes f4. Yeah, I would start to think about king h7. But I would definitely uh, be thinking in terms of capturing uh, right away. In that position we just analyzed, by the way, we came to a rather interesting moment and that moment was knight versus bishop. How many of you recognize the fact that there was a there was a imbalance? White had a dark squared bishop, black had a knight on g6. The knight on g6 was no great shakes, but on the other hand, that knight g6 had potential. If if a black queen lands on g3, then knight takes f4 is a stone cold winner, right? So that white would have had an isolated pawn or a pass pawn uh, in all of those things. And also my judgment was, hey, would be like, hey, is that a position where my knight's better than his bishop, right? Anytime I get an advantage, I think, okay, got me an advantage, need a little bit more. <laughs> what else can I get achieved? So bishop f5, I'd calculate. Rook d5 would be my first choice, of course. Regrettably, knight h6 loses, so king h7. So if we would have, if black could achieve this position, in other words, according to the rules, make two moves in a row, which is illegal, we could say white resigns. Queen h6 and queen h7. Yeah, 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 queen h6, and queen. I'll take your king, right, exactly. But if black could achieve this setup, uh, he's losing a piece. Uh, the, the knights, are stuck to one another, the pin, it's, it's terrible. So king h7 with the idea of rook d5 gets my attention, bishop f5 gets my attention, knight f4 gets my attention. So running down my checklist, uh, this looks like a reasonable move, but it would probably be my third, perhaps fourth choice. But not bad, not bad. King h2, recognizing correctly, <laughs> that, the king, that the king's in deep doo-doo, uh, king h2. Okay, b4. Okay, again, this is like a kind of a, a running down the list, but we did mention that this move b4 um, can be frightening. Uh, again, it's that double-edged sword. When you play the move b4, you really got to pat yourself on the back, say, yeah, baby. I'm really undermining this knight. But we're also opening up this bishop, right? If that knight for some reason doesn't fall, and we, we answer takes on b4 with a bishop takes b4, we might, we might just be uh, playing into white's hands and opening up the bishop on b2. Rook on c1 to d1, okay. So white says, hey, you're attacking my knight. I'm going to defend it. B takes c3. Bishop takes c3. Bishop takes f5. Ooh, not sure I like that so much. Bishop takes f5. Knight takes f5. And boy, has suddenly the world turned. Um, there's an issue is a very big issue to be addressed. Bishop is, uh, is being threatened. Uh, the bishop has to go back. So I would say the last two, three moves have seen black's advantage drop a lot. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, it's sort of like joy and happiness just came up. Uh, white has played the move bishop d4, and as you say, Joe, uh, you warned me going in that queen c7, and I guess the rest of the game devolved into a time scramble and you yeah, didn't have the score? Minute, I probably have a minute and a half. You stopped taking score yeah, at this I point. Have, I probably should have stopped sooner, but... How did the game end? Uh, 
Um, what I ended up uh, blundering a piece. Okay. So, so he's got some precedence by being a, I remember trying to block A with the minor piece on E3. Right. And then trying to like get my wrist back in the C and D files and trying to trade off it. I was like, if I can actually get to a point where I like the A and B pawns against A pawns, maybe I can get something. But yeah. With that little time, all the threats in your king still look this tiny. Right. Well, I would say that, that what has happened, in fact, is this is probably one of your bad, better moments in the game yeah. than it, what it had happened prior. And that you've actually defended pretty good. And I would say all three results are possible here. Yeah? Uh, but an intriguing game, uh, with, uh, which is just the, the, the type of game that uh, I love to analyze. I always think that well-played chess games are really a battle of ideas, yeah? You come to the game with your ideas, and whoever's ideas are superior is going to win. Uh, having said that, my favorite type of game is the total crush, <laughs> right? <laughs> I am not one of those people that like, you know, 21, 24 football games. No, 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 no. When the Dallas Cowboys are playing, I like 28 nothing. <laughs> to me, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful football game. And so I really like the chess games that are total crushes where you just wipe the guy out. You just never had a chance. But having said that, these, these games are also very, very good. They, you learn a lot. And you learn to appreciate that, um, in fact, every, every move has its upsides and downsides, and we certainly see that here, as that bishop just kind of came to life a moment ago. We're going to take a pause. It's 8.20, 10-minute break. Anybody got a game or something to come back? And I'd love to look at a game. Mm -hmm.